Hi, I'm Caroline, and my partners Claire, Quay, Rebecca, and I explored 3D printed scaffolding to facilitate bone growth following lower extremity trauma. Throughout history, methods of bone reconstruction and repair following lower extremity trauma have evolved remarkably. Of these, amputation, bone grafting, external fixation, osteocutaneous flaps, and the masculette technique have been the most prominent and long-lasting. Case studies from the 18th and 19th centuries show that amputation was becoming increasingly popular for lower extremity trauma. Physicians were less concerned with whether or not there was a better treatment approach and more focused on how to execute the best amputation. However, losing a limb is an immense impact on an individual's quality of life, including physical functioning and mental health. The procedure can also have medical complications, including discharge of pus from sutures, and scarring can take weeks to months. Over 200 years later, amputations are still used for extreme cases. Today, amputations can cost between $87 and $100,000, only making this treatment more undesirable. With biological breakthroughs of the 19th century, bone grafting was developed. Bone grafting is the surgical addition of a segment or segments of bone to the end of a damaged existing bone to allow growth between the bones and at the end of the new segment. The new bone can come from another part of the individual's body, which is called autografting, or from a different individual or animal, which is called allografting. Despite the benefits over amputation, bone grafting will likely yield a shorter bone than that of the matching limb, and total recovery is not always possible or may take many years. With the addition and union of many bone segments, there is often an irregular shape to the bones or resistance to union, which can cause pain. Allografting also adds the possibility of bodily rejection and can lead to graft versus host disease. Progressing into the late 20th century, there is increased usage of external fixators. An external fixator is a stabilizing metal frame outside the body that is screwed or pinned to the bone inside through incisions in the skin and worn for about a month to a year. This device is meant to hold the bones in place and give the individual greater stability and range of motion. Although this is a fairly easy and temporary fix that works well in managing complex fractures, there can be sepsis at pin sites, pressure necrosis of the skin if in contact with the frame, and continued problems with lower extremity stability. The mechanical system can also interfere with a person's vasculature or cause ischemia or fibrosis of muscles and tendons. Around the same time period, osteocutaneous flaps were also gaining attention for reconstruction of intricate areas of bone. An osteocutaneous flap is a flap containing bone, soft tissue, and skin with a defined blood supply. This treatment supplies the material necessary to build back that which was damaged in trauma. However, research on osteocutaneous flaps in the ankle has found that patients walk slower and with shorter strides and experience ankle instability and weakness in the leg. 41% of these individuals also reported being dissatisfied with their ankle function three years post-operatively. As with allografting, osteocutaneous flaps also leave the possibility of bodily rejection of the transplant. Some of the most current practices in reconstruction of trauma-related bone defects involve the masculette technique. The masculette technique consists of removal of damaged tissue and foreign particles from the wound, insertion of a polymethylmethacrylate cement spacer, removal of this spacer without disturbing the induced bone membrane, and insertion of a bone graft. This induced membrane created prior to grafting supplies growth factors that may be instrumental to this method's success. However, little is known on the efficacy of this treatment, and the limited existing research has presented inconclusive results. Moving into the modern era, previous treatments to foot trauma weren't as popular as the new method that involved 3D printing. The 3D printer was invented by Charles or Chuck Hall in 1984, and he referred to it as the apparatus for production of three-dimensional objects by stereolithography. 3D printing uses a variety of materials and can create any shape by applying layers of the powder material fused together with a binding agent. This can also create a variety of topographies, shapes, and textures. In the early 2000s, the first medical application of 3D printing was mainly used for dental implants. By 2004, however, there was more research into the orthopedic applications of 3D printing and this also was a cause of printers becoming more widely available and cheaper. In the orthopedic area, engineers and doctors were able to create structures that perfectly mimic the extracellular matrix and provide a great foundation for cell attachment and can promote new bone growth in intense cases of trauma where natural regrowth usually does not occur. And these structures are called scaffolds. Scaffolds are biodegradable implants that promote tissue and bone growth and can be made using a variety of methods. However, 3D printing to create scaffolds allows for more specificity and control. Some ways that scaffolding can be optimized would be to keep the pore size at 100 micrometers since that is the size of an osteon. 
Another would be to increase the pore volume, which would then increase permeability of nutrients into the scaffolding, and that will promote bone growth and biodegradation of the scaffold. A third area of optimization would be to find a balance between pore size, pore volume, and mechanical strength. As can be seen from the images to the right, using 3D printing can create fine and precise pore sizes, shapes, and surface topographies on a micrometer level. Although 3D printing is a huge improvement on previous methods, there is still much room for improvement within 3D printing. For instance, the binder used to solidify the powder material needs to have specific chemical properties and needs to be used at a discrete concentration. And this would be unique to each material. So there is so much more research that needs to be done to fully improve upon this. Second, the post printing object has many loose particles on it that need to be removed before use to keep the implant ser sterile. However, the autoclaving and post-processing of the implants generally shrink or crack the implant, which could be dangerous in a patient. Third, ceramics are more commonly used. However, better materials need to be tested to better match the material and mechanical properties of human bone. And lastly, overall, each decision of pore size, material, pore volume will either increase or decrease mechanical strength. So an overall balance of optimization of each property and how each property relates to one another needs more research and development. However, the applications and possibilities of 3D printing and scaffolding make the future of orthopedics very promising. The current device being used to treat severe trauma to the lower extremity is bone grafting in conjunction to an external fixator. This device has many limitations in its efficacy and recovery process. The current bone graft procedure yields its own set of limitations. Non-unions between segmented bone can occur if the bone graft's geometry is incompatible and causes misalignment. Non-unions can also occur if the bone graft is unable to osseointegrate. Autographs, which is bone transport directly from the patient, are limited by available bone mass in the body. Additionally, complications may arise at the autograft donor site. Allografts, which is bone transport from another human, are less osteogenic than autographs, which lead to higher rates of non-union. Both autographs and allografts have been known to refracture or undergo collapse, even later in osseointegration. There may also be mismatches in the osseous anatomy of where the graft is obtained versus where the graft is implanted which affects the ability of the reconstruction to achieve the correct shape. The main limitation of external fixation in the context of severe trauma to the foot and ankle is the long non-weight bearing period. External fixation can be utilized for upwards of 12 to 18 months post-operation and is a severe hindrance to daily function and causes significant loss in work productivity. During this long recovery period, refracturing at the point of osseointegration can occur, and the healing process is dependent on the patient's long-term compliance to instructions of care and investment in the recuperation. Next, we will be moving on to the new device proposal. As seen in the picture to the left, there are many small and intricately placed bones within the foot and ankle region, all of which are important for a patient's mobility. This makes successful reconstruction difficult. However, a promising case of a 46-year-old female with extensive trauma to the foot and ankle from a rollover vehicle collision illustrates one of the first successful examples of 3D printed technology being used in conjunction with previous medical techniques to reconstruct the lower extremity. The patient sustained a left open distal intraarticular tibia fracture with substantial distal tibia bone loss. She also sustained many other fractures to the fibula, talus, calcaneus, cuboid, and second through fifth metatarsals. After discussions with the patient about treatment options, physicians decided to attempt a novel 3D printed titanium scaffold designed to give her the best chance at regaining normal function. While the 3D printed design was being developed, the patient was initially treated with a traditional external fixator along with the masculet procedure, which uses an antibiotic polymethyl methacrylate spacer to temporarily realign and stabilize the injury. A CT scan was sent to 4Web Medical, an orthopedic implant device company, to design a custom 3D printed scaffold. Using a modeling software, engineers determined which portions of the damaged bone needed to be removed in order to properly place the new implant. The pieces they decided to remove are highlighted in red in the 3D rendering of the injury. Engineers then developed a model of the 3D printed scaffold. The scaffold is composed of a titanium alloy and has patented truss structure as well as roughened texture to facilitate osseointegration. 
It has a volume of 30.7 centimeters cubed, which, fun fact, is about the volume of a ping pong ball and replaces 8.5 centimeters of bone loss in the distal tibia and talus. The third picture illustrates how the scaffold will be fixed internally using a long tibiotalocalcaneal arthrodesis nail and two proximal and two distal interlocking screws. Four months after the accident, the patient went into surgery and the external fixator, antibiotic spacer, and the bone fragments identified in red on the earlier slide were removed. The removed bone was more sliced and combined with allograft bone embedded with stem cells and then packed into the 3D scaffolded implant. Before the scaffold was placed in the body, as seen in the image to the right, a model piece shown in the bottom of the figure to the left was placed into the irrigated wound to ensure that the implant would fit properly. Once this was confirmed, the model piece was replaced with the actual implant and fixed internally with the arthrodesis nails and four interlocking screws. From zero to six weeks post-operation, the patient remained non-weight-bearing. From week six to 12, the patient had limited mobility in a cast. After week 12, the patient had full mobility in a boot, and at six months post-op, the patient no longer needed any support for the foot and ankle and was back to her regular everyday life as a school teacher. Combining the four months of external fixation and the six months of post-op recovery, in just 10 months, the patient regained her full quality of life with no resulting pain or effects from her previous trauma. This recovery time is less than if she had just been treated with the traditional bone graft in combination with the external fixator, which typically takes 18 months to regain normal function. The patient has followed up with CT scans every six months since the implant was placed. Yearly CTs show progressive growth of the bone around the implant cage, as seen in the figure. It is worth noting that at one year post-operation, there was still no bony bridge at the proximal anterior junction between the tibia and 3D printed implant. However, the physicians and the patient agreed to just continue monitoring the junction since there was no associated pain, and after two years post-op, CT scans demonstrate bony bridge growth which strengthens year after year. At five years post-op, CT scans illustrate successful bone incorporation of the talus, calcaneus, and tibia. In addition to a faster recovery period, this new device made multiple other improvements. The added strength of the titanium scaffold decreases risk of refracture and is a more secure way to align the bones than an external fixator. The roughened surface of the titanium scaffold increases surface area for bony ingrowth and promotes more osseointegration than that of the traditional bone graft. Taking the autographs from the original site of injury ensured a match in the osseous anatomy of the distal tibia, which increases the chance of a successful reconstruction of the correct shape. It also eliminated a second wound at a separate donor site. Additionally, the embedded stem cells in the allograft promoted osteogenic qualities for faster and stronger bone growth. Lastly, the 3D printed fabrication allowed for the creation of a patient-specific custom implant that matched the patient's bone geometry and perfectly fit at the site of the injury. This decreases chances of non-unions, incompatibility of the bone and implant geometry, and device misalignment. Overall, the new device design decreased chances of infection while increasing osseointegration, resulting in the successful salvage of the foot and ankle at a faster recovery time. That being said, there are still limitations to the new device. It is unknown how stress shielding and implant failure can manifest within a patient long term since this treatment is so novel. Stress shielding is the likely reason behind the delayed bone growth at the junction highlighted earlier. Although bone growth occurred after the second year post-op, the junction was more susceptible to failure during this delay. Additionally, although this case study has successful bone and implant union, non-unions are still possible in future cases. Finally, 3D printing technology is still very expensive. The fabrication and surgical implementation of this implant cost $20,000. However, cost-effective analysis comparing amputation to 3D printed implants for salvage show that salvage is the less expensive option over the course of a patient's life. As adoption of 3D printing technology increases in the years to come, cost of 3D printed implants will decrease. Overall, 3D printed titanium scaffolds packed with autographed and allographed material has the potential to reign as the new gold standard to treating severe trauma to the lower extremity.